Glad to, Brent. Thanks. Thanks to everybody. Um, and Mike uh, sure would be providing this uh, introduction for James, except uh, Mike is out using his mom's iPad and the connection's uh, so so. So I'm going to go ahead and do it here. So James is the director and founder of Geo World Travel. He'll tell us a little bit about that. He personally guides most of the Geo World Travel's trips. He's a geologist with a degree in geology from the University of Bristol and has a master's in oceanography from the University of Southampton. And before setting up Geo World Travel, James traveled to, he says, around 100 different countries and worked as a geologist on guide aboard um, expedition cruise ships. And 100 countries is right around half of the countries on Earth. So he's been around a bit. Um, and the, the list of countries that uh, and areas that he's guided to is just too long to read. It just it's a, a lot of different places around the world, a lot of really, really neat places as well. Um, his passion for communicating about geosciences began when he started his career working in the television documentary, documentary industry. And he was the researcher uh, on uh, Discovery Channel geological series and was part of BBC's Blue Planet series, which I suspect we're all familiar with. Um, so uh, if you would be so kind as to join me in welcoming James Cresswell, we're going to get a wonderful tour of East Greenland. Take it away, James. Okay. Um, um, hi. Uh, thank you for that introduction. And um, I'm just going to um, share my screen. I think I have shared it already. Uh, and um, I will um, I will uh, start uh, the talk. So um, have I got my pointer? Hang on. I'm just going to get my uh, pointer. For my time. Yeah. Okay. We don't have your screen up yet. Yeah, okay, uh, right, sorry, I have done that wrong. So let me click share screen, why is that not working? We, hang on. Um, share screen, share. I was just doing it wrong. Okay, so, um, and um, have I got the pointer? No, let me just get the annotator. We did all this in the practice, of course, and then you come to the real thing. It is midnight here. Anyway, okay, thank you for the introduction. And here I am. Uh, and um, I think I might as well uh, just, just make a start um, uh, with, with the talk uh, about the geology of Greenland. So um, this wonderful photograph at the, on the cover of the presentation, I'll come to uh, in the presentation. So I, I won't uh, talk about that now. But um, so I'm going to be talking about uh, East Greenland uh, and uh, Greenland is 80% covered in ice uh, and this ice is up to 3.4 kilometers thick or um, 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 uh, up, yeah, up to 3.4 kilometers thick, uh, nearly five miles. So this is not uh, the type of place that you might normally be thinking of um, for, for rocks. But in fact, uh, there is quite a, an area around its coastline, which is, un, which is exposed rock. Uh, and uh, that uh, area of rock is about the same in area as the area of the UK. Uh, so uh, 410,000 square kilometers. And the largest uh, ice-free area in East Greenland is this area um, here around uh, the Kaiser uh, Franz Josef Fjord, uh, the Kongoska Fjord, uh, and the Scoresby Sund uh, Fjord system. And this is the area I'm going to be uh, talking to you about tonight. Uh, and it has uh, incredible uh, geology um, with rocks uh, as old as three billion years old, and then a nearly continuous uh, sedimentary record from about one and a half billion years ago to the present. So it really is uh, a superlative uh, destination uh, for geology. Now, um, the, the, the trip um, that I, um, well, in that introduction, we said how I traveled all around the world and I run these uh, geological tours. Well, for 10 years before I started my own uh, geotourism company, I was the guide on uh, trips to Antarctica and the Arctic, uh, telling people about the geology. Uh, and uh, this, is, this is the route uh, of, uh, of the trip, the, the, the route that takes you to the area uh, which I'm going to be talking about now. Uh, and I guided on that nine separate times. Uh, and here is uh, me um, holding court, uh, giving a geology talk to some interested uh, people listening. Um, now, how I'm going to uh, do this talk is I'm going to talk uh, in 
chronological order from uh, the past going to the present. So talking about green as old as rocks, uh, going to the younger rocks. However, before I do that though, I'm just going to tell you something that's sort of out of order, just to uh, make you make some things a bit easier to understand. Uh, and the whole uh, northeast coast of Greenland here is labeled as the East Greenland Caledonides. Uh, and um, what that actually means is um, the rocks here were all, um, they've all been involved in a plate uh, collision where two plates came together uh, and uh, the rocks uh, here have all been thrust and slid over the top of each other in great thrust sheets or naps. And I just want to tell you this before I start, uh, because all of the rocks in East Greenland, older than 430 million years old, are on uh, one or other thrush sheet. Uh, and then the younger rocks are spread out over the top. Uh, and it just makes a bit more sense just to explain that now, because you have some rocks which are of the same age, but are quite different to each other. And that depends on which uh, thrush sheet they're on. Uh, and um, the thrush sheet, which is uh, in the interior of the fjord system, is called the Nigli Spids thrush sheet. Uh, and the thrush sheet that's uh, on the exterior is called the Haga Bjerg thrush sheet. Uh, and these, uh, these thrush sheets were made in the Caledonian orogeny in the Silurian 430 million years ago. And we're now, now come to that in order and we'll go back uh, to 3 billion years ago uh, to start the talk. But just a little bit more about the thrush sheets before I go back. Um, what Greenland was like before the Silurian is the eastern portions of it were, were much further out than they are today. Uh, and these uh, pieces of East Greenland have all been um, thrust uh, together and slid over each other. And another uh, thing just to mention uh, is Scotland. Uh, I don't know if many of you are familiar with the geology of Scotland, but the geology of Scotland is actually very similar to East Greenland. Uh, and here you can see the Hebrides, Northwest Highlands, Shetlands, this is the Great Glen Fault that goes through Loch Ness and here's parts of Ireland uh, and Svalbard in the Arctic is also all in pieces. All of the, these geologies are connected and all of these pieces got slid against each other and thrust over each other. So just telling you that uh, just to start uh, and then I'm going to go in chronological order. So, um, so, so here is just a cross section uh, of, uh, of the different thrush sheets um, sliding uh, over each other. So going back to the earliest times, and I'm going to actually just mention a couple of things about West Greenland before I go on to East Greenland, because West Greenland actually has the oldest rocks uh, in Greenland. Uh, and in fact, the, the oldest rocks in West Greenland, when they were first uh, discovered, were actually the oldest known rocks uh, anywhere in the world, and are actually 3.8 billion years old, uh, an outcrop near Greenland's capital, uh, Nuuk, uh, on the West Coast. And here's just a, a map of, of the world showing that uh, in the Archean, um, we had a less uh, continental crust uh, than we do now. Uh, um, but by um, these times in the Archean, uh, little blobs had come into being, which are going to be the core of, of the future cratons. Uh, and um, most of uh, Greenland and Scotland here uh, had actually uh, come uh, into being by the Archean. And of course, as you all know well, there's a piece of a uh, very old uh, cratonic crust uh, in Wyoming uh, as well. So uh, the issue of uh, Greenbelt uh, in West Greenland, uh, when it was discovered, they were the oldest known rocks in the world. Since some older rocks have been found in northern Quebec, uh, which I think uh, are actually 4.2 billion years old, but these rocks in West Greenland are still the oldest known metavolcanic uh, rocks, metasedimentary rocks, and oldest sedimentary rocks uh, in the world. Uh, and uh, they also um, contain um, particles of carbon, which could well have um, been derived from uh, algae, so uh, perhaps also showing the earliest evidence for life uh, anywhere in the world. But the oldest rocks in East Greenland are a bit younger, they're, they're only three billion years old. Uh, and during this uh, presentation, I'm going to be illustrating it with photographs I took. Uh, and I worked on these cruises, which the itinerary wasn't necessarily orientated for the geologist. Uh, it was, you know, where a ship could go to, and it was about wildlife and history. So uh, some of the examples of the rocks is just the best uh, pictures I could get uh, on an itinerary that wasn't completely geological orientated. Uh, but anyway, I saw um, an outcrop of this three billion year old rock, uh, and here it is in this photograph. So here uh, in the center of this photograph is an outcrop of gneiss that is three billion years old. Uh, and I'm actually standing right on this jagged line here, a thrust fault, uh, but looking over where it says GN. 
uh, and uh, looking at this uh, three billion year old rock. And I'm gonna come back to tell you about that thrust fault later on. But this is uh, a geological map uh, of the area. And this shows the Scoresby Sund uh, Fjord uh, and uh, I'm right in the interior of it here, a good hundred miles uh, inland. Uh, and these fields have all been um, created by uh, glaciers that were much more extensive in the ice age uh, and the ice has since uh, retreated and the sea has uh, flooded in. So uh, coming um, a little slide now going back to West Greenland, just to quickly say, um, as the, 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 um, the craton of Greenland was forming, um, um, Continental fragments would collide with each other. One would subduct underneath each other. As it subducted, it would make uh, different rock types, uh, rocks like granites that didn't like to um, get consumed again in, in further collision. So the amount of um, crust grew and grew over time. But it wasn't actually just as simple as just accreting and accreting. There were actually periods where um, bits of crust rifted apart uh, only to come back together again. So in West Greenland, we see um, an example where around 2 billion years ago, uh, some continental fragments rifted apart and came back together. But you're playing with so much time, stretching from 3.8 billion years ago to 1.8 billion years ago, 2 billion years of history. Uh, so an awful lot uh, can occur. But anyway, um, the next oldest outcrop of rock I saw in uh, East Greenland uh, is 2 billion years old. So we've, we've, a whole billion years is gone. Uh, but it's still an incredibly uh, long time ago. Uh, and this outcrops in the only town in East Greenland, uh, in northeast Greenland. And this is the town of Itatoka Tormiet, uh, which is quite a, a mouthful to pronounce, and I probably haven't said it completely right. Um, but the Danish uh, name for the town is Scoresby Sund. Uh, and this town is actually um, artificial in many ways because um, the Norwegians actually had a claim on uh, North uh, East Greenland, while Denmark controls all of Greenland. Uh, and to really be sure that um, the Norwegians wouldn't um, take North, North East Greenland, uh, the Danish moved uh, an Inuit community up to North East Greenland and uh, Inuit in Greenland are Danish citizens. So um, it is uh, settled by Danish citizens. Um, but it is an area where Inuit uh, did live um, in historical times, um, but um, it, you know, well, not in recent historical times, it's on more archaeological times. But anyway, here is a, a picture of some two billion year old uh, nice from Isatoka Tormiot. And where that is on the map, by the way, of a settlement is just here at the entrance to the Scoresby Sun uh, field uh, system. So the next uh, bit in our story uh, of East Greenland um, is um, these uh, sediments which have been metamorphosed uh, called the, the, the crum, Crumidal uh, super uh, crustal sequence. Uh, and um, over a 50 uh, million year period, about a billion years ago, uh, sediments were deposited in an unknown uh, location, uh, uh, probably to the southeast of Greenland in the ocean, uh, were transported some considerable distance in a deep ocean environment uh, to get um, um, deposited um, or to be, to be uplifted uh, up on, onto the land. Uh, and uh, this is a um, up to eight kilometer uh, thick sequence um, of rock which was originally uh, sedimentary but it has been metamorphosed. And the degree of metamorphism depends on which thrush sheet you're on. If you're in the uh, interior thrush sheet, the niggly spids, it hasn't been uh, metamorphosed very much. And actually in this place K, uh, which is actually um, Crumidal, uh, you actually have um, a lot of the original sedimentary uh, sequences preserved, uh, structures preserved. But in, if you're on this thrush sheet, uh, the Hage Bjerg thrush sheet is very heavily metamorphosed uh, to, to a nice. Uh, and, um, and, and this is why I was telling you about the thrush sheets. But here is a, a photograph uh, of, from, a, from a textbook actually um, of, um, the, um, of a cliff containing uh, these meta sediments. Uh, and it's our first introduction really to the grandeur of Greenland because can you see this uh, wonderful uh, fold here? But then we look at the height of this cliff and this cliff is about um, two kilometers high. So, you know, it's like, um, what's that, like a, um, a mile and a half high. So it's just that staggering. Uh, and uh, these giant icebergs are in the field here. So the scale of Greenland is actually uh, mind blowing. Uh, and uh, but a photograph of um, Cromedal rocks that I've actually seen myself. 
So uh, here is uh, my backpack and my rifle here for polar bear protection. Uh, and uh, looking out to the distance, uh, these are cremedal rocks. Uh, and I'm actually standing uh, on uh, the Hagerberg thrush sheet. Uh, and where this red dotted line is, is actually um, the, the, the boundary between uh, the Nigley Spuds thrush sheet and the thrush sheet I'm on. Uh, and the cremedal rocks are actually uh, on the other thrush sheet. But this um, bit of rock just here, which I'm going over with my marker, is actually the very same basement rock I showed you in the previous photograph, the very same outcrop, in fact. Uh, and you've actually got uh, um, this, within this thrush sheet, you've got other thrust faults, uh, and the cremedal uh, rock is thrust over this uh, basement rock, which is actually still part of the thrush sheet. Uh, and another unit within the cremedal rock is thrust over this lower unit in the cremedal rock. So all a little complicated, but where, where I have seen it. And then in the background, you can see this white uh, tongue, tongue of ice, uh, and that's a glacier that's draining from the inland ice. And if you were to walk up this and you get onto the top here, it'll be flat white ice and you can walk right across Greenland uh, to the west uh, coast. So here's a little close up. It's the same photograph I showed you earlier on when I was talking about the oldest rock in uh, East Greenland, the three billion year old rock. But in the foreground, it's one billion year old rock and here it's one billion year old uh, cremedal rock as well with um, a thrust uh, within it. And of course, a, a thrust here as well. So and going back to this diagram, I'm standing on this uh, jagged line, which is this red dotted line. Uh, and I'm looking over this three billion year old rock. Uh, and I'm looking at this brown rock with a thrust fault in it and this yellow rock, uh, which are all just two different units within the cremedal rock um, there. So, um, I sent some more photographs uh, of the scene. This is looking back over that thrust fault. Um, the, you, and this is where I took the previous photograph. I was standing there uh, and now I'm standing here. So you're on the two different um, thrust uh, faults. Here's a little close up of some of this cremedal rock. Uh, and you can see here, this has actually um, been quite heavily metamorphosed. Uh, and uh, you've got these beautiful big red garnet crystals that have developed uh, in it. Uh, and the, the beach behind is just um, pieces of, of garnet uh, li lying about from uh, rock that is uh, eroded uh, down. Here's uh, some more um, um, pictures of some cremedal rocks. This is an erratic of cremedal rock um, further uh, away from the area uh, that I happened to see when I was on, on a hike uh, and uh, just uh, looking at it. Uh, and you can see in it there are uh, pieces of, of mica, um, um, garnets and also uh, the kyanite. So this is a garnet kyanite mica schist uh, and um, it is um, not very heavily metamorphosed but that is you know quite metamorphosed uh, so. Uh, and um, I'm just uh, comparing it to Scotland. Uh, in Scotland there are rocks of very very similar age, in fact exactly the same age, which are also metamorphosed and these are called the Moyne group uh, and uh, these uh, units are really analogous to each other. Uh, for those of you who know uh, Scottish uh, geology. So while we're on the subject of similarities with Scotland, of course the reason why Scotland and Greenland are so similar is because they were connected uh, and they were connected from the earliest times, three billion years ago, right up to just 50 million years ago. Uh, Scotland was basically part of Greenland, they were the same thing. Uh, and uh, here is a picture uh, from Scotland with um, three billion year old um, rock here, cut by 2.4 billion year old rock, uh, cut by 1.8 billion year old rock. Uh, and this basement uh, in Scotland is actually very similar to uh, the three billion year old rock you see in East Greenland. Uh, and also here is a picture of some one billion year old um, sedimentary rock called the Tor Torridonian sandstone, which is exactly the same age as this cremedal rock, except it's not metamorphosed, but Scotland does have metamorphosed rock uh, of uh, the same age. So we're now uh, swinging forward a whole another billion years and we're up to one billion years ago. Uh, and we've got the first uh, supercontinent that our planet uh, knew called Rodinia. Uh, and uh, probably in the audience, you will know that several times in Earth's history, uh, the continents have all come together uh, to split up again. The most recent um, supercontinent that had all the continents was Pangaea. Um, but um, this is further back. This is a billion years ago. Uh, and it existed from about 1.3 billion years ago to 700 million years ago. Uh, and later on in, in the, the formation of Rodinia, uh, the continent Baltica, 
um, collided in with uh, La Rentia, which is uh, Greenland and North America, and um, you've got um, other continents, uh, and it sort of grazed its way um, up, uh, up the coast. Uh, and as it did so, it metamorphosed those um, crumedal uh, sediments. And the sediments which were on the outer thrust sheets got really intensively metamorphosed. And the ones which were further away from the collision because they were um, uh, on what was, you know, on, on the, because these thrust sheets were not formed in this orogeny, they were formed in a later orogeny. So, so the, 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 the rock that was on the outer uh, thr thrust sheets was much further to the, to the east than the rock on the inner thrust sheet. So it got much more heavily metamorphosed by this collision. And where it got most uh, metamorphosed is um, this area here called Oifjord. So uh, our ship would come in here to uh, Scoresby Sund. It would sail down Oifjord. Um, this is the area which I've been talking about so far in the presentation, but this is where I'm going to talk about now, uh, Oifjord. Uh, and in Oifjord, you've just got fabulous scenery as you have um, all, all around East Greenland. Uh, and uh, these chromedial sediments have been highly metamorphosed uh, or even completely uh, remelted uh, into granites uh, during uh, this Grenville orogeny that formed uh, Rodinia. Uh, and uh, here is a picture of, of myself there uh, pointing uh, at uh, some of the scenery. And again, these are sort of mile high cliffs, uh, staggering scenery. Uh, and here, a huge recumbent fold. If you can see this fold here uh, uh, coming around and here another uh, fold uh, coming around. And what we're looking at in these folds is these are millions and millions and millions of crystals of garnet. Uh, but here, these are white sheets um, of algan granite. So here, the rock completely uh, melted, but here it didn't melt, uh, here it partially melted and the garnet crystal stayed solid and they um, aligned uh, and flowed. Uh, so you've got um, um, so alternating layers of completely uh, melted uh, algan granite with very, very large quartz and plagiolase clays crystals uh, and uh, layers of, of uh, garnet crystals, uh, all in a huge, huge fold. And again, just a staggering scenery. One of the few places in the world where you can just be a few miles away from it on the ship and just seeing the scenery as it goes past, seeing um, this staggering uh, geological story. So here again, we've got a, a fold coming around here, uh, a glacier coming down, icebergs, which would be the size of cathedrals. Again, a mile high cliff. Uh, here is, is another fold. This is all, all garnets, all these red crystals and, and sheets of algan granite where the rock completely uh, melted. Uh, and here's some close up detail um, of, of the difference between um, the, the, the white color of, of the algan granite uh, and the um, red uh, garnet crystals. So then the next uh, story uh, in the history of East Greenland uh, is a story of sedimentation. Uh, and you have uh, 450 million years of continual sedimentation from 900 to 450 million years ago. Uh, and 18 and a half kilometers of sediment gets deposited. And these are some of the most photogenic rocks uh, in uh, Greenland. Uh, and the biggest uh, unit of them is called the Eleanor Bay Supergroup, which has a um, 14 and a half kilometers thick of sediments uh, divided up into uh, four different groups. And these are all totally unmetamorphosed. There's then um, uh, another unit on top called the Tillite Group, which uh, has uh, records of Snowball Earth, and I'm going to come to that. A slight time gap or unconformity, as it's called, uh, and then we come into Cambrian uh, Silurian or Cambrian Ordovician and Silurian marine sediments uh, on top of that. So, but first of all, we'll talk about the Eleanor Bay Supergroup, which is divided into the Nathos Land Group, uh, the Lyle Land Group, the Ama Oi Group, and the Andre uh, Land uh, Group in the Tonian and Cryogenian periods um, just before uh, the Cambrian. So, on this uh, colourful uh, geological map, which I think is a really pretty map, um, you can see um, the um, pink, uh, dark blue, bright blue colours uh, and the green colours. This, so not the green, uh, the pink, dark blue and light blue. This is all the Eleanor Bay uh, supergroup. And our ship would sail in from uh, Svalbard. It would come uh, up here, up Kaiser Franz Josef Fjord, uh, come down to, to this area here. This is called Antarctic Sound. Um, named after a ship 
that was a whaling ship that uh, used to also go to Antarctica. Uh, it would um, sometimes call it uh, uh, Maria Oi or Ella Oi. Uh, it would come down to Sekelskarskapet, which I'll talk about later on, into Alpafjord and then out Kongoska Field and then into the um, Scoresby Sund uh, field system uh, to the south. So here's a picture from Antarctic Sound. Uh, and this is a picture from a textbook, first of all, showing the Andre Land Group, the Um Oi Group, and the Lyle Land Group. And here is a photograph I've taken at exactly the same location, uh, showing uh, these different groups. And you can see it's just a riot uh, of beautiful colour. Uh, and uh, here are my uh, geological map hanging out of my pocket, uh, pointing uh, at um, at the same uh, place, pointing at um, the um, an outcrop of Andre Land Group. And um, what are all the colours for? Well, the colours um, are representing um, changes in the depositional environment. Uh, and this uh, mountain here is called uh, Tiefelschloss, which means the Devil's Castle. And what we can see here is we can see um, mudstones from a, a deeper um, water environment. Then you can see these pale um, rock here from a shoreline uh, environment. Then there's a, a tidal a plain environment. Uh, then you get um, a, a deep, deeper water again, um, with, and then you get carbonate uh, deposits. So what we're seeing is over this uh, long uh, time period, the sea level would rise and fall uh, and you would get uh, different uh, sedimentary rocks uh, deposited. So mudstones, sandstones, limestones, uh, dolomites, uh, all to, to make these really beautiful um, colours. So perhaps the most beautiful uh, cliff of all is uh, uh, the Basulius Bjerg, uh, 1,900 metre high. So again, uh, you know, over a mile high. Uh, and you've got the Ama Oi and Andre Land groups uh, preserved in it and just these spectacular uh, colours. Uh, and here is a, a sedimentary log um, showing, um, um, showing mudstones and sandstones, conglomerate, silty limestone, limestone, dolomitic limestone, dolomites, and uh, diacetomy, uh, so diametite, which is the uh, tillite group. I'm going to talk about that later. That's uh, the snowball earth deposits. So anyway, here is uh, here's me, and I'm looking at Basuliusberg, just just wonderful, uh, beautiful mountain. Uh, and uh, here um, is the island called Maria Oi, which I mentioned uh, before, saying we sometimes stop at these islands. Uh, and uh, we landed here, uh, and this is looking at the Ama Oi group on. Uh, the southern part of the island and walking out into the northern part of the island we're seeing the Andre Land Group uh, and here are some uh, stromatolites uh, that I found uh, in this uh, outcrop of Andre Land uh, Group. So Precambrian stromatolites a bit like uh, you have uh, in the Grand Teton uh, National Park. Now on top of um, the, um, the Eleanor Bay supergroup um, is the Tillite uh, supergroup. And here you can see uh, it conformably overlying it. So here you've got the colorful uh, Andre uh, land group from the Eleanor Bay supergroup. And on top of it, this gray, um, less uh, colorful um, rock, which is from the Tillite group. And looking at this map, the dark gray that we can see is where it outcrops. Uh, and uh, I witnessed it here in Antarctic Sound uh, and in Kaiser um, Franz Josef uh, Fjord. And this picture here is taken in Kaiser Franz Josef Fjord. So um, here is a, a close up of it. Uh, and one thing you will notice uh, is it's uh, is this gray color, but also it's very heavily folded. Look at the layers. Uh, and these, sorry, just coming back, these uh, folds all happened uh, in the Silurian Caledonian orogeny that I mentioned at the beginning of the talk, but I'll come on to that later on. But just uh, to uh, show you um, what it looks like. Uh, and um, to tell you now something about Snowball Earth uh, and what we're actually seeing uh, in the um, in the Tillite supergroup, it's uh, spanning uh, this uh, time period here, uh, and you actually have um, you have um, Tillites. So Tillites are um, unconsolidated rocks which uh, get deposited under ice sheets and uh, you have uh, two different uh, episodes of it deposited in uh, in the Sturtian and in the Moronian. So um, and here's, here's the time, so around 700 million years ago and around uh, 640 million years ago. Now interestingly at both of these times Greenland was actually in uh, the southern hemisphere right near the South Pole so it's perhaps no surprise that there were ice age uh, deposits. 
However, what is a surprise, um, and maybe many of you know this story already, it isn't only in Greenland that you find Ice Age deposits. In fact, there are Ice Age deposits found all over the world at this time. Uh, and uh, it's uh, theorized that there were perhaps uh, four or even five different episodes uh, in uh, the uh, cryogenian uh, period um, where the entire planet became covered in glacial ice uh, and all of the world's oceans uh, froze. Uh, and what is sort of the hallmark of these snowball earth events is after the, the cold uh, period had come to an end, uh, the planet very really rapidly went from a, a snowball phase to a complete hothouse phase, uh, hotter than, than some normal conditions before settling down to normal conditions. And in these hot conditions, you would actually have tropical uh, deposits, limestones and dolomites deposited, uh, and Greenland, uh, what's extraordinary about it wasn't that it had the Ice Age deposits, it's actually it then had the tropical deposits put directly on top of it. Uh, and I'm going to uh, show that in the next slide. But here is um, a map showing where uh, Snowball Earth uh, deposits from the Moronian occur uh, and from uh, the Sturtian. Uh, and just doing a little sales pitch to some of my other tours, uh, I actually see um, Moronian Ice Age deposits in uh, Namaskluft in Namibia. And here's a picture of drop stones and the fallout of icebergs. And I also see Sturtian uh, deposits in uh, Gubra in Amman in the Middle East. Uh, and here are um, um, Snowball Earth deposits and lying on top of them is cap uh, carbonate uh, cap uh, capping them. And actually, um, Deborah Brand listening to a talk in your group, she was with me at both of these sites uh, uh, we, we have, be, have been to. Actually, sorry, Deborah wasn't with me in Namibia. She was with me in Iceland. So, sorry, Deborah. But, uh, but she were with me there in, in Amman. So, but what um, you've seen in, um, in Greenland is, um, is here you've got the, the di diamictite, this unconsolidated glacial deposit capped with a capped dollar stone, uh, uh, exactly the same uh, as this photograph from Amman. So you, you see this uh, at a place called uh, Cap Weber, uh, and Cap Weber is just there, that point just there uh, in Kaiser Franz Joseph Fjord. So a real interesting uh, global story. Other places where you see uh, the tillites deposited, uh, you see them also here on Ella Oi, uh, and uh, I'm going to show you that right now. And here is a um, research base on Ella Oi used by geologists, but also used by uh, Greenland's famous uh, Sirius Patrol. Uh, and uh, as I said before, the Danish own Greenland, uh, and uh, they maintain sovereignty over the whole vastness of uh, Northeast Greenland with a traditional dog sled patrol, uh, and they will uh, go up and down it, uh, and they will also stay at this base. But in the base, I've only been to it once, uh, and when I went to it, there was no one there, but we could go in the huts, and there's this geological map on, on the notice board there, uh, and we land just here. And uh, the, the green rock uh, in the foreground is this green rock here. It's actually Cambrian age rock. But these bands of rock here, these purples and greys, this is these units here. These are all the, the tillites. So um, that is pictures of the tillites. Now, the next part of the story is the opening of the Iapetus Ocean. So if you remember, Baltica had come and collided in with Laurentia. It had uh, metamorphosed um, rocks. Uh, it had highly metamorphosed the rocks on the uh, outer, uh, these outer areas, and only slightly metamorphosed these inner areas. Baltica then splits away. An ocean forms between Baltica and Laurentia. And then Baltica comes back in again and collides um, in the Silurian. Uh, and that's when all these pieces get thrust over each other. So, but anyway, so we're going to see an ocean open up. Uh, and while that ocean is open, marine sediments are deposited in the Cambrian, Ordovician, and Silurian. And those of you who are familiar with British geology would, would know that, um, that um, Scotland, which is part of um, Greenland, um, is on one side of the ocean, and England and Wales are on the other side of the ocean um, and come and collide um, with Scotland. Um, at, in the Caledonian orogeny when we get to the Silurian. But first of all, we're talking about the Cambrian uh, and Ordovician. So here are some Cambrian uh, marine sediments uh, on Ella Oi. It also has Ordovician age rock there. Uh, and uh, one of the uh, interesting uh, things about the Cambrian, and I am digressing here, um, and because it's not really related to the talk, 
but the most celebrated and famous uh, fossil site of the Cambrian, uh, not that far away from where you are, is uh, up in Canada, the Burgess Shale uh, site, uh, where um, the um, representatives of all the modern uh, animal groups um, uh, were there in the, in the fossil record and perhaps some weird and wonderfuls that, um, that, that, that went extinct. Uh, and I just wanted to say that I used to be a guide there. And here's a picture of me guiding there. And I spent uh, one summer uh, leading hikes uh, up there uh, every day and I got very fit, I'm telling you. Um, but there's a similar site in Greenland. Uh, it's a bit older than the Burgess Shale. Uh, it's, uh, it's another um, 13 million years older. It's called Sirius Passat. Uh, and it's actually on the, the very north coast of Greenland, so not in the area I'm talking about, but I just thought I would mention it uh, as it's such a uh, interesting place. Uh, and like the Burgess Shale, it has a remarkable uh, soft body preser preservation uh, and it is one of the most uh, important paleontological sites uh, of the Cambrian period. And also something else just to mention about the Cambrian, as I'm speaking to you from Wales, um, the Latin uh, for uh, Wales is Cambria. Uh, and uh, the Cambrian period is named after Wales uh, because it is the very first uh, place uh, in the world where rocks of that age uh, were described. So uh, just mentioning that. So here is just some of the, the fauna from the Burgess Shale. I'm not going to talk about them because uh, of time constraints uh, and that can be a whole uh, separate talk. Um, but uh, we're moving now forward to the Silurian. So you've got the uh, Ordovician, um, we, we talk about, and actually while I'm talking about Wales, why not mention it? Uh, the Ordovicies were a tribe of people in North Wales and the Silurians were a tribe of people in the South Wales. So actually the Ordovician period and the Silurian period are also named after Wales. So the Cambrian, Ordovician and Silurian are all named after my country, Wales. But anyway, that's digressing because we're now getting back onto the story. So Baltic has come apart uh, and it's now gonna come back and crash uh, into Laurentia as is Avalonia, which is probably broken off uh, South America, a little sliver. It's got uh, uh, Newfoundland on it. It's got England and Wales, uh, parts of Northern Germany. And the two of them, they collide into Laurentia and it's the Caledonian orogeny, uh, named after Caledonia, which is the Latin name for Scotland and makes a huge uh, mountain range uh, in uh, Norway, East Greenland, through the British Isles uh, and down into uh, North America. And what did it do to the rocks in Greenland? Well, what it did was it um, completely um, folded uh, and uh, metamorphosed uh, the rocks that were there and thrust uh, rocks over each other. So, um, so here is a, a, a wonderful uh, fold. You can see the rocks uh, folding around. Actually, I say it metamorphosed rocks. It's more actually thrusting rocks, um, pretty untouched actually, uh, and folding rocks. So this is uh, the, the Caledonites. Uh, and then uh, shortly afterwards, uh, in the Carboniferous period, you actually, and the Carboniferous period, uh, of course, for you guys is the, the Mississippian and Pennsylvanian periods. Um, you have um, Gondwana, which is Africa and South America uh, and, and bits of Europe come colliding in as well. Uh, and this um, made, uh, extended the range of mountains. It made the Appalachians, it made the Anti-Atlas Mountains in Morocco, uh, it uh, folded mountains in southern Britain, including where I'm speaking from uh, in Wales, uh, and um, it makes a, a whole big chain of, of mountains altogether. But uh, these collisions would have made mountain chains uh, the height of the Himalayas. Uh, and uh, as I said, uh, it thrust uh, the layers over each other in these great naps. Now, while we're talking about thrust faults, uh, the very first thrust fault to be recognized anywhere in the world uh, was recognized uh, in Scotland uh, and it's uh, the Moyne thrust uh, and it's actually a, a great story uh, in the early uh, origins of geology because the Victorian uh, geologists simply couldn't understand how you can have metamorphosed rock overlying unmetamorphosed rock and what we have in this picture is one billion year old uh, Moyne metamorphic rock which is analogous to that Cromedal rock I was talking about before overlying um, Cambrian um, marine Cambrian limestone, which is very similar to the Cambrian uh, limestone I showed you on El Oi, uh, and it had thrust over. And that how this got figured out, this controversy was, it was recognized what had actually happened, that rock had thrust over rock uh, by hundreds of kilometers. And this very same uh, moine thrust that you see in Scotland is all part of this same story as those thrust faults 
uh, in uh, East Greenland. So the rocks um, in uh, Greenland and Scotland, uh, the rocks thrusted uh, from east to west, while in Norway, the rocks thrusted from west to east uh, and, and slid uh, over each other. Uh, and this is the, the, the diagram I've shown you before. You've got uh, this Nigli Spid thrust sheet and this Herger Bjerg thrust sheet, and it all came into being uh, in uh, the Caledonian orogeny. But um, as well as uh, thrusting uh, the sheets over each other, it also um, injected um, granites uh, and melt uh, into the area. And this is um, a picture of a wonderful mountain called Grundes uh, Vik uh, Kirke in uh, the field called Oifjord. It's um, nearly two kilometers high, so nearly a mile and a half high. Uh, and this rock uh, here is that very same highly metamorphosed um, um, chromedal sediments, which are now this, um, now this migmatite actually, a mixing of rocks uh, is what it is. But if you actually look uh, closely here, uh, the top is a different color. This is a pink color uh, and it's actually a granite intrusion. Uh, and it is only 450 million years old, while this is a billion years old. Uh, and uh, this dark strip here as well, is also a similar age as this. It's also a Caledonian uh, intrusion, uh, and it is, um, a, uh, is, is a, the chemistry is hypersthene monzonite, uh, and uh, is, is a sort of granitic rock. Uh, and here is um, further down Oifield, another such intrusion, uh, intruding in to um, the, um, the migmatite, which, which is what I was showing you before with the, with the, um, the garnets and the algan granites. Uh, into that sequence is this black rock that's been intruded in, which is a Caledonian uh, intrusion. So while we're talking about these Caledonian intrusions, um, on this uh, geological map here, if you look at the orange colour, these are areas where there's quite a large amount of um, Caledonian aged um, granite. Uh, and this is an island called Damark Oi, uh, and I'm standing on Damark Oi here, and you can see how these uh, granites are all uh, smoothed by ice has passed over them. Uh, here is a ptarmigan uh, actually standing uh, on top of the granite, but uh, just showing you uh, a nice photograph of the granite. And if we come back to this photograph, this is looking out over, um, it's looking over this piece of water here. Uh, and um, I'm looking at this purple color, which is layers and layers of uh, basalt, which are only 50 million years old. But I'm gonna talk about those uh, later on in the presentation. So we come to this photograph, uh, and this photograph uh, was on, on the front cover of, of my presentation. Uh, and this is um, this wonderful Basuliusberg mountain, again in the background, uh, with the Eleanor Bay supergroup. And the reason why I'm showing you the photograph again, uh, this site again, is because it's this fold here. You see this eye? Well, this is a fold. Imagine the rocks folding over this way. Uh, and um, these uh, Eleanor Bay groups rocks, they got gently folded and faulted in the Caledonian orogeny. Uh, and this site, here's my colleagues all standing on it, is such a, a favourite site of mine that actually on my uh, GeoWorld Travel website, uh, where I've got all my different uh, geological tours around the world, um, I actually use it as the banner photograph for my website because for me it's just beautiful and it's actually my favourite geo site. So that's why I put uh, the picture up uh, for for the banner on all of my uh, web pages. But I'll show you some more uh, folding now in the Eleanor Bay supergroup. So here are uh, some wonderful layers all folded. Here is a more folding. Um, this is uh, at that place, Sarka Skelskapet, just uh, the rocks folded. That's the eye. Uh, here it's, it's not really folding, but it's just showing how the glacial ice has gone over the area, smoothed it. It looks almost like the, the belly, well, the, the throat of a baleen whale. Uh, with an erratic on top. Uh, and these, um, this rock here is just a close up showing what I believe to be a dolatomization channels, uh, sort of showing that the process uh, when, um, how it was changing from limestone to dolomite, I think. Um, also these Eleanor Bay um, rocks were faulted. Uh, here you can see, see a fault here. Um, also you can see a fault uh, this way, a thrust fault here. So folded uh, and faulted in the Caledonian orogeny. But now we move on from the Caledonian orogeny and we're moving uh, into the time period where it doesn't matter about what thrush sheet you're on because 
things start getting uh, covered uh, in a uniform uh, sedimentation. Uh, and the next uh, part of the story is the eroding down of these Caledonian mountains. Uh, and Greenland uh, in uh, the Greenland's now in Pangaea because, um, as I talked about, the Variscan orogeny, Gondwana, uh, collided. Uh, and Greenland is uh, a really hot, uh, arid place. And what is happening is as the Caledonian mountains are getting uh, eroded down, uh, seasonal rivers would be flowing in this hot, arid environment, depositing uh, sandstones. Uh, and these are uh, the old red sandstones. This is just um, a, a graph just showing um, Greenland's journey from the Devonian, where it's uh, right uh, uh, near the equator, uh, heading, heading north uh, to its present uh, polar position. Uh, and there's an almost continuous sedimentary record, as I, as I said before, um, to, to, to show this whole story. So what about the old red sandstone? Well, um, here, is, um, here is a map of where old red rocks are outcrop, uh, the Appalachians, uh, Ireland, Wales, Scotland, uh, Norway, um, East Greenland, uh, and Svalbard. And here is a picture from East Greenland. Here's a picture from Svalbard. And here is a picture from where I'm talking to you now. Uh, this is the Brecon Beacons National Park uh, where I live. Uh, and this is our local uh, mountain uh, just down the road from my house. Um, in Scotland as well, there's uh, Old Red Sandstone. Uh, and I'm just uh, highlighting this place, the, the Arcaragas Quarry, because it's actually very, very famous in having produced thousands of Devonian uh, fossil fish. And this is a story that is also replicated in East Greenland, and more than 10,000 fossil fish uh, have been found uh, in East Greenland uh, in uh, these uh, seasonal river systems. Uh, and most of the fossil fish have been found um, on uh, this mountain here, Stensio Bjerg, uh, and also here, um, this mountain here called Celsiusberg. Uh, and here are some, uh, some uh, pictures of, of Devonian fossil fish. But perhaps the most famous uh, fossils to come from Stensiaberg are these uh, tetrapods, uh, Ichthyostega and Acanthiostega. And these are these wonderful links between amphibians uh, and reptiles, uh, and hence us. Uh, the story uh, of evolution in front of you, the fish turning into the tetrapod. Uh, and uh, here, uh, uh, here's a picture of Ichthyostega, uh, picture A, uh, its skull, uh, and, um, and, and, and th th those are Ichthyostega, and D is uh, Acanthyostega, uh, and so is E. So those were found uh, there on Stensioberg. Here is uh, Celsiusberg, uh, and I actually landed there once. Uh, and on Celsiusberg, a third species of tetrapod has now been discovered just here. It's exactly the place that I landed. Uh, I didn't see any fossils when I landed, but I could uh, make out these fossilized river channels. Um, and you can have uh, see the cross bedding here uh, and just here, just a scenic picture of these red uh, Devonian uh, age uh, sediments. And incidentally, from where I'm talking to you now, fossil fish have been found, uh, Devonian fossil fish, just two or three miles from my house, actually. So I live in another uh, place where they can be found. So we now uh, move into the uh, early Carboniferous, uh, which is, uh, you know, in the, I forget which way round it is, the Miss Mississippian or Pennsylvanian, but um, it's one of the two. We, we call it Carboniferous here in, in the UK, uh, as you might know. But moving into this time, uh, Greenland uh, is uh, continental the whole time, and it carries on being hot and arid with uh, red colour sediments. Uh, here in the British Isles, it is quite different. We have a, a period where we have um, tropical limestones, and then we have coal swamps, which gives it the name uh, uh, Carboniferous. Uh, and when you are in, in Wyoming, I'm, I'm not sure, but in this diagram, it's showing it as terrestrial. So um, through the Carboniferous and Permian, it's, it's red color um, uh, uh, sandstones. It's uh, red because uh, in these arid conditions, hematite can cope the sand grains. Uh, and then these uh, sand grains later on become uh, uh, sandstones. And a place analogous to this is the Namib Desert uh, today with this process in Namibia, in Africa, where this process is going on. Looking at this geological map, um, this uh, gray color here is marked CP. So this is Carboniferous to Permian Age rock. Uh, and here is a picture. It's the same picture I've already shown you in the talk when I was talking about the chromedal uh, sediments. But uh, in the foreground, what I'm standing on is uh, carbo Carboniferous to Permian Age 
uh, rock, and that, that's why it's red in colour. Here are some more uh, outcrops of it, uh, these making these wonderful uh, red coloured uh, uh, scenes. And our ship would sail down this uh, fjord called Rode Fjord. Rode means uh, red in Danish, uh, and we'd be looking out for muskox. If we saw muskox, we would launch our boats, come ashore, and try and get close up pictures. And me being a geologist, I would also enjoy walking up these uh, gulches here, uh, and you can see uh, the, the different uh, uh, sediments, the conglomerates, uh, and, um, and see the different depositional environments that this rock was deposited in. One of uh, the most uh, pretty places, though, in Rode Fjord is actually Rode Island. Uh, and this is a Rode Island, and you can see it's got a sort of Roche Moutonne shape where uh, ice has gone up uh, one side of it, uh, and then it's um, harder at this end, uh, so it's made, uh, it it's, hasn't eroded this end so well. And the reason why it's harder is because this end is cut by a Paleogene a 50 million year old um, um, dikes. And I'm going to come on and talk about those uh, later on in the talk. But for now, we're talking about Rhodey Island. Uh, and uh, it's this really pretty place where you've got the contrast of white uh, icebergs uh, and red uh, rock. Uh, and here you've got this sort of hoodoo type formation here. And here you've got poorly consolidated, poorly rounded uh, sediments. Perhaps they had slipped down a hillside in some sort of alluvial fan. Uh, and um, here's a, a geologist who I met who happened to be one of the guests on one of these trips. And here's me with, with a gun in case the polar bear shows up. Uh, and uh, the contrast between white and red uh, really makes for some gorgeous, uh, lovely photos. So we now uh, move on into the Mesozoic. Uh, into the Triassic. We pass over the Permo-Triassic extinction. Um, as you probably all know, 95% of all living things that went extinct, uh, the greatest mass extinction our planet uh, has ever seen. Uh, Greenland carries on being hot and arid. Uh, here is Pangaea, Greenland's right in uh, Pangaea, uh, and so we carry on with um, hot uh, arid conditions. And uh, Triassic rocks outcrop uh, is this sort of orangey colour, outcrop here in um, the southern bits of Kongoska Fjord uh, and a few uh, areas here. An interesting thing about the Triassic of Greenland is actually dinosaur uh, tracks have been found uh, and the uh, dinosaur uh, Plateosaurus, the, the Triassic uh, dinosaur Plateosaurus in uh, this area here called Carlsberg Fjord. I uh, sadly never got to go to Carlsberg Fjord, but I did come into Hurry Inlet which is um, here near uh, Isitokotomiut, uh, and in Hurry Inlet you've got uh, Triassic uh, sediments as well, uh, and I found these are uh, plant fossils, bits of fossilised wood, here's a fossil leaf, uh, more leaves, so uh, Triassic uh, plant fossils. Um, the observant in you might notice this black line, this black line is actually a sill of a Paleogene uh, uh, basaltic rock, but we'll come on to that later on. But the sediments here are Triassic aged uh, sediments. So we now uh, come on to the Jurassic. Actually, we actually have some rifting between Laurentia and uh, Baltica. Um, it's not enough rifting to make a, an ocean. It just uh, has a graben uh, and uh, this area drops down. It allows a, um, the sea to flood in, but just flooding in on continental shelves. So not a true ocean, just a shallow uh, sea in a failed rift. But uh, it's enough uh, water to preserve the whole of the Jurassic um, in, in the sedimentary uh, uh, layers. Uh, and you've actually got 60 different ammonite uh, stages um, preserved, uh, making it arguably the best place in the world to study ammonite evolution. Uh, and also um, a, a plesiosaur has been found in these sediments. So a plesiosaur was found just here, a place called Cap Leslie. But what this um, diagram here is, is to show you is Cretaceous rocks. So we move into the Cretaceous uh, and there's a little bit of Cretaceous here on Jameson land. Here's a photograph of it as I pass in a ship. I've never landed on it. Here's a photograph of it. I've taken off the internet with some um, limestones um, and it was shallow marine uh, in the Cretaceous. But the big story in the Cretaceous though is the hot spot. So what is this hot spot? Well, Greenland has been passing over a stationary hotspot. And I imagine uh, all of you in uh, Jackson are very, very familiar with your own hotspot uh, under Yellowstone uh, and uh, the sort of the trail it has left uh, behind. 
Well, the same thing is going on. Um, Greenland has been moving uh, over a, a stationary hotspot, uh, and, uh, but it's all under ice. Um, but by uh, 50 million years ago, uh, the hotspot was here uh, on the east coast of Greenland. Uh, and um, th this, um, what this did uh, was um, lava um, from it. Actually, the theory is because this is such thick, old, old, old cratonic crust, it couldn't burst through um, here. Uh, and by the time it got to um, where East Greenland, where the crust was thinner uh, due to um, the earlier on, I was talking about this uh, sort of failed rifting coming down between Greenland and Norway. I was talking about it for these Jurassic sediments. Well, because of the thinning of the crust, the, um, the lava could break through here. Um, but portions of it also spread underneath Greenland and they broke through here as well. This failed rift um, also between Canada and Greenland, and then portions of it also spread it south and erupted out in the British Isles, uh, in uh, Northern Ireland and in Scotland. And this hotspot actually um, is responsible for, um, well, the Atlantic had already started to split in the Triassic uh, between Morocco and the US. It was split, was all, all already splitting here, but this hotspot uh, allowed the North Atlantic uh, to split uh, and the hotspot is now currently under Iceland uh, and it is causing Iceland. Uh, and um, as, um, as um, the plate with this uh, spreading ridge is trying to move across it, uh, it keeps jumping the rift uh, further to the east. Um, and, and that is uh, the story of the geology of Iceland, which is um, something, a subject of a completely different talk. But, What's it causing in Greenland 50 million years ago? Well, massive, massive amounts of lava are erupting out. They also erupt out in West Greenland and also in the British Isles. So in the British Isles, here's the Giants Causeway World Heritage Site in Northern Ireland. Here's Fingal's Cave in Scotland. Uh, but uh, in East Greenland, it's very much more dramatic. There's six kilometers thick of lava that erupted out. And all of this a gray area here uh, is uh, these flood basalts. Uh, and, um, well, you know, you know about flood basalts, the old Columbia uh, River uh, flood basalts. Uh, and um, this uh, volcanism lasted from 60 million years ago to 30 million years ago uh, in East Greenland. Uh, and uh, here are pictures of the layers and layers and layers uh, of basalt. Uh, and here is the unconformity of a billion year old uh, metamorphosed uh, chromedal rocks with 50 million year old uh, lava layers on top on uh, in an area called the Volkart Boons uh, coast. So I showed you pictures um, of the Giants Causeway. It's a World Heritage Site. World Heritage Site probably because it's in a popular populated area uh, which people can get to. It makes it famous. Here, um, no one's ever seen this. Uh, no one ever goes here. Just spectacular um, uh, columns that uh, if it was in a, a um, popular area would be famous but um, it's, it's virtually unknown. Uh, and this is a place called Viking Bukta uh, in uh, East Greenland. So um, some more close up pictures of it. Uh, here's the columns. Um, perhaps um, the reason why there's a wave in the columns is because the, the lava still has a movement in it before it completely solidified. Here, the direction of the columns changes 90 degrees. Uh, and uh, perhaps uh, it was now the cooling source was 90 degrees cooler than, than, than elsewhere than it was before. Um, I'm, I'm conscious of the time, so I'm just um, gonna talk a bit quicker. Here is me just pointing at these wonderful layers. Uh, here is a, an agate I found uh, at the site, uh, and uh, the lavas would actually have um, holes in them, uh, gas vesicles from, from gas that was in the, the, the lava flow. And then later on, water would pass uh, through these holes with um, silica dissolved in it, and it would precipitate uh, out, uh, making these uh, wonderful agates or, or chaldogeny. So um, we've already talked about Rhodey Island. Here's its uh, dikes uh, from, from this time period. Here's sills uh, in Hurry Inlet that I've talked about from this time period. Uh, and probably uh, one of the most famous uh, things for geologists from this time period is the famous uh, Skengard intrusion. Uh, and um, our tours would come in around here, but once I actually came down the coast here and came here to Skengard. Uh, and this is the textbook example of the layered intrusion. Uh, and some of you may have read about it in uh, geology textbooks. 
And when you have a, a, an intrusion and it has a long time to cool, different minerals will um, solidify first uh, and settle to the edges of the magma chamber, leaving the composition behind uh, different uh, and the, the, the magma chamber can get stratified. And what this can do is it can concentrate um, metals uh, in uh, layers or reefs. Uh, and the famous um, um, Bushveld complex in South Africa is an example of this. Uh, and the Skangaird intrusion actually um, is a site which could potentially be mined. Uh, and uh, here is layers of gabbro in the Skangaird intrusion. Uh, and talking about minerals, this uh, diagram here shows a, a gold um, and a palladium a reef in the Skangaird intrusion, which leads me on nicely to talk about minerals uh, and Greenland has mineral uh, outcrops uh, all around it. Uh, there have been a, a few um, mines dug in Greenland, but because of its isolation, um, little has been mined. But very interestingly, um, China currently wants to build a mine in Greenland and it wants to bring 15,000 uh, workers to Greenland, but Greenland only has a population of 40,000. Uh, and in elections just a few months ago, the anti-mining party in Greenland won the election because Greenland has some autonomy from, Greek, from Denmark, even though it's controlled by Denmark. So it's gonna be quite interesting to see how this plays out uh, with the local people not actually wanting the mining to happen, but of course the mining being worth uh, an enormous amount of money. Uh, and America, your, your country, has offered to buy Greenland uh, from Denmark, uh, rather like uh, you bought um, Alaska from Russia, because um, of obviously it's very good with all the mining, but uh, Denmark uh, has uh, turned that down. So um, when I came into my tours, uh, I ship past in here, as I told you, uh, and on this map, this is marked as a site of near Proterozoic copper. And these are copper uh, deposits in the Elena Bay supergroup. And here am I pointing to some copper mineralization. And what actually happened is these thrust faults in the Caledonian orogeny, these, um, these uh, faults, these cracks, make pathways where water with these minerals dissolved in it can pass through uh, and deposit uh, these uh, metal uh, deposits. So this is um, where Ellen Bay is actually in the Kaiser Franz Josef Fjord. And this um, site here I've read in a scientific paper is actually a site with a gold bearing vein uh, that I happen to have been very close to. So just some more uh, about uh, the gold here. This is the gold bearing vein I was talking about. Actually, I was just standing there. There's lead. There's the world's biggest deposit of, deposit of molybdenum, which is its picture here, but it's surrounded by a glacier on all sides. So very, very hard to mine. Uh, rare earth elements here in, uh, in Milner land, the gold and palladium at Skengard. Uh, and uh, around uh, all of Greenland, you've got diamonds in West Greenland, rubies and sapphires. And here is Chaldrogeny and Agate in that uh, Viking book to place that, uh, and here's the one uh, I actually found. There's also oil and gas, uh, Jameson land, uh, which is where all the Jurassic sediments are, has oil and gas, but it hasn't been exploited. And also offshore of West Greenland, there is uh, oil and gas that is also not yet uh, exploited. And I'm just gonna come to, to the end of the presentation now, uh, just with a few, just a little bit about the ice, just for, for one or two minutes. Uh, and just so I wanted to say that in the highest part of the last ice age, there were three uh, ice sheets in the Northern Hemisphere. There was an ice sheet over uh, Canada and uh, the Northern parts of the US. Um, there was an ice sheet over Europe, uh, extending into the British Isles. And there was an ice sheet over Greenland. Now, the, the European one and the North American one have melted away, but the Greenland one has remained. And the Greenland one is actually a relic of the last ice age. It formed in the last ice age, but it wouldn't exist on the planet under present uh, climatic conditions. Uh, so if you removed it, it wouldn't reform, but it exists still because this ice is so thick that here is at elevation, uh, making it cold all year round uh, and letting the ice maintain. But of course, in the last ice age, the ice was more extensive in Greenland uh, and it extended all around the coastline right out to sea. Uh, and this is the reason why these fjords exist that our ship has been sailing around because they were carved out uh, in uh, the Ice Age. And Scoresby Sund is uh, 400 metres deep right into the interior here. Uh, and this is um, uh, really wide. I've actually forgotten the figure off the top of my head, but it's the biggest fjord in East Greenland. 
Uh, and here are these wonderful uh, Eleanor Bay sediments again with Vesuliusberg there, but it's the reason you have this alpine uh, scenery, rather like the Tetons uh, with um, these arets uh, and horns, uh, because it was more glaciated in the Ice Age uh, and ice has retreated, uh, leaving uh, this pattern. So the Greenland Ice Sheet uh, is up to 3.2 kilometres thick. Uh, it could raise uh, sea level by uh, seven metres. Uh, and the bad news is it is now in negative mass balance. It is actually getting less ice year upon year. Uh, and um, it's uh, losing ice at its outlet glaciers um, in, in the west, but also in the east. Uh, on our trip, we would see um, here the, the, the Religi uh, glacier that's losing quite a lot of ice. Here's a picture of it. Here's a picture in Alpafjord uh, of us passing a glacier that until recent times went right across this field so you couldn't pass. Uh, and um, what's going on in Greenland is I said that on the surface of the ice sheet, it's always so cold, but in actual fact, the surface is now beginning to completely melt at the height of summer. You get um, big, um, you get uh, big lakes of meltwater forming, rivers draining from them. They then find uh, crevasses and they drain right down to the base of the ice sheet um, and they lubricate the ice. Uh, and this combined with warmer ocean currents coming into the fields, cutting away at the outlet uh, glaciers is uh, leading to uh, less ice year upon year in Greenland. This is the Helheim glacier. This shows 2001, 2003, 2005. It went back 25 kilometers just in that time. Jakobshavn in West Greenland, it's gone back 70 kilometers uh, from 1851 to 2009. It's further, even further back now. Uh, and uh, basically um, the Greenland ice sheet uh, will uh, melt away um, and um, but how quickly it melts away uh, depends on the atmospheric carbon dioxide concentrations uh, and we're talking about thousands of years for it to melt because as you know if you take ice out of your freezer and, and leave it there it doesn't melt instantly it's still there the next morning uh, and takes uh, a long time to melt but when uh, all the ice does melt uh, the interior of Greenland will be left below sea level but that will actually rebound um, with ice static rebound eventually, but that would take a long time. And Hudson's Bay, for example, in Canada, this is actually still below sea level from the last ice age, but that will rebound and be above sea level ultimately, but it's still rebounding from the last ice age. And that uh, brings me to the end of my talk. Uh, and um, if any of you want to go to Greenland, um, I um, am no longer personally going to Greenland unless I can get five people and then I can take you there personally. But um, I uh, sell uh, places to go to Greenland on either of these two websites, my Polar World Travel website, and my Geo World Travel website. Uh, and I also though personally lead many different geological tours around the world. Uh, and these are all listed uh, on uh, Geo World Travel. So thank you for listening. Oh, and one last thing, the Northern Lights. It's one of the most wonderful places to see the Northern Lights in East Greenland because it's predominantly a high pressure. Uh, air is falling on the, on the ice sheet because of the cold, uh, making the pressure high. Uh, and while it's normally cloudy and difficult in Iceland, in the interior of the fields in Greenland, it's nearly always clear uh, and it's a fabulous place to see the Northern Lights. So I'm gonna stop sharing uh, and thank you for listening. All right, James, thank you so very, very much. Uh, that was a wonderful talk. In fact, one of the, one of the questions, this isn't a question, it's a comment, it was just wow. Um, so, but uh, there are some questions. Um, so let me start with a little bit about the, the tours and how long is the vis visitation season for Greenland? When is the best time and how long are the trips actually to a place like that? Okay, the visitation season is only in September because um, earlier on in the summer, the sea ice is too extensive for shipping to be able to get into the fjords. So it's only in September uh, and uh, you have two options. You can do a, a trip that um, comes in from, um, actually, if I just share my screen again, I can, I can show you that. Yep. Uh, if I just share the screen um, and um, can you see this screen here? Is that sharing? Yeah. Yeah, and if I come, come to Greenland, uh, you can see that um, th there's two different trips to Greenland. There's um, one which um, comes in, it's 13 nights. It's this one we talked about. Uh, and um, 
and there's also a shorter one which goes to and from Iceland just into the, the southern area, Scoresby Sund, uh, and that is, is nine uh, days. So um, I only uh, offer those two trips. Uh, other companies also go to Greenland, but it's only in, in this uh, time because um, there's, no, um, there's no airports here uh, and you're accessing it from Iceland or from uh, Svalbard. Okay, um, questions so about me, uh, polar bears. Let me stop sharing. I'm just trying to remember how to do that. The questions okay, you, about- You're not sharing, bear. so fine, no problem. Okay. Uh, question, uh, how often did you encounter polar bears and did you ever have to use the rifle? Um, the question, yeah, in, in East Greenland, I only saw a polar bear once and I never had to use a rifle. In Spitsbergen or Svalbard, um, we saw polar bears many times. Uh, we would see um, maybe 30 or 40 bears on a single trip. Uh, and I did have an exciting uh, moment once where um, I was uh, leading a group uh, and we heard on the radios, there's a polar bear, there's a polar bear on the site. So, 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 so I called my group together, got them, gathered them together and brought them up to a bit of high ground. And I could see, I was on a little high ground that the topography went down a bit and then went up again and there was another group being led by colleagues of mine and there was a big old looking male polar bear walking straight at them and what um, they did was they fired their percussion grenades at it which let off very loud bangs and smoke uh, and the first one boom the bear just ignored it and just walked through the smoke uh, another one was fired it ignored it again uh, it took seven of these fired at it before it finally took off uh, and ran and started running straight at me. So I lifted up my rifle uh, and realized um, their group was directly behind it. So there's no firing of live rounds uh, and um, got my percussion grenade out as well to, to, to fire it at it. But luckily it veered uh, and, and, and went past our group without me having to, to fire it. Uh, and we, we radioed the ship and said, you know, send in boats, we need to evacuate. Uh, and as luck would have it, as one of the boats was coming into the bay, there was a walrus feeding uh, and just as uh, the boat went over the place where the walrus was, it came up for air and it attacked the boat and punctured it with its tusks. So we're now on the beach uh, with this boat sinking and the polar bear is now coming back and, he, and he's walking down and he just sits there and looks at us. Uh, and um, anyway, more boats came and we evacuated everyone. So that's my hairiest time. But in a, actually in the whole history of polar tourism uh, in, in the Arctic, um, I think a polar bear has only been shot dead on a tourist operation once in Svalbard, uh, and, um, but bears get shot actually every year by local inhabitants uh, as a safety measure. Uh, and also, of course, in, in the Canadian Arctic and Greenland, Inuit people will hunt polar bears. But I think polar bears are quite rare in East Greenland, uh, and one reason might well be because Inuit people actually hunt them. Um, but so I only ever saw a polar bear once in East Greenland. A long answer, but hopefully an entertaining one. All right. Question. Uh, somebody noticed that uh, the supercontinent Rodinia had all the continents together. And question was, uh, did this affect Earth's rotation? I don't I don't think it affects Earth's rotation. Um, I, 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 um, I, I, I haven't heard unless anyone else in the audience has heard that supercontinents affect Earth's rotation. I, I, I think you know, when you're thinking that, you know, the thickness of the crust is only the thickness of a postage stamp compared to a soccer ball, uh, having all the continents on one side, I don't think makes a difference. But if anyone else in the audience uh, knows otherwise, uh, please say, but I, I don't think so. I don't. Um, so a uh, question, um, you, you talked about uh, the tillites and et cetera associated with uh, snowball earth, uh, you know, when earth was, uh, believed to be completely, uh, you know, iced over. And the question was, uh, what caused the end of the snowball earth phases? Um, well, the, the main theory is volcanoes came to the rescue uh, and um, volcanoes would erupt through the ice, uh, you know, and they can melt uh, through, through, through the ice uh, and uh, they would emit CO2 into the atmosphere. Uh, and this CO2 built up and built up and built up and built up. And then it reached a sort of threshold where suddenly it was on a runaway greenhouse effect. Uh, and not only did it melt the ice, it then turned everything super hot. And when this ice melted, it would have just been staggering. Uh, you would have actually had you know, sea levels uh, changing by you know, you know, kilometers 
uh, in in you know in in very short time periods. So so really really um, really um, spectacular. But volcanoes is the leading theory uh, that 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 released Earth from Snowball Earth. Yeah, there, there's a question about um, the uh, you know formation of the supercontinents Gondwana etc. And uh, the question is how accurate uh, do you think those maps of uh, that uh, that early Earth are in terms of where the continents were? Probably not very accurate. Um, you know, it's 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 a best 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 uh, educated guess. I mean, you know, of course there is evidence that you see you know the similar rock types in different places, and you fit those together, and there's paleomagnetic evidence. But um, you know, I think. Um, you know, it, it's all it's it's the best stab at what we've got yet, and and uh, some more evidence might come, and it might change the map a bit. But um, but I wouldn't I would say they're good guesses, but they're not going to be exactly right. Uh, and you have different uh, geologists who uh, pro propose different reconstructions, and they don't agree with each other. Um, so, um, but um, but yeah. Yeah, I sort of a mechanical question. Somebody asked if uh, compasses work in Greenland. Um, well, <laughs> you have to. Um, they point to the, the magnetic North Pole. So um, it depends where you are in Greenland. Um, if you're um, in northern Greenland, the magnetic North Pole is going to be due east of you because the magnetic North Pole is in northern Canada, um, sort of uh, near Devon Island. Uh, so you've got to adjust the declination on, on, on the compass uh, uh, quite heavily, um, but it will point to where the magnetic pole is, but that's not necessarily to the north. Okay, uh, the question here is, uh, when uh, did you decide to grow the spectacular mustache and beard since we don't see that in any of the photos of you? Um, COVID lockdown. <laughs> Yeah, we couldn't, we couldn't, we weren't allowed to go to um, hair, barbers or hairdressers, for, you know, for a long time here. So it's, um, and actually it was a lot bigger, my beard. And my wife said I actually looked like a tramp, like some sort of homeless hobo. So um, I've cut it shorter, but. Um, <laughs> All right. Um, I kept the mustache. The, I want to remind everybody that uh, in two weeks time, we have Sean Wilsey who's going to talk about uh, the Snake River Plain and volcanism and the interaction between um, lava flows and the, the ancestral snake river so that will be back at the regular time at 6 p.m uh, for us local local time here in two weeks time and i want to remind everybody that um, james has stayed up until after 1 a.m right now there in wales making this wonderful talk for us providing this wonderful talk so on behalf of everybody i just want to say you know, for a wonderful talk, many, many thanks. And we really appreciate your, uh, you're already into the next day and, and we appreciate your doing this for us. So many, many thanks, James. Pleasure. And one last thing I just forgot to mention, I actually wrote a, a magazine article about the geology of East Greenland. Uh, and if you go to my website and navigate to the Greenland page, you'll find it there and you can download it, uh, which is kind of everything I just told you in the talk, but in, in, in article form, if any of you want to read that. Well, we will, and people will have a chance to uh, direct uh, their friends to this uh, talk or recording of it as well. So again, many, many thanks. Go to bed. Hopefully the caffeine will keep you up that you took to be so nice <laughs> and bright and cheery. And we really appreciate it, James. It's been a wonderful presentation. Okay. Thank you very much. And I, I'm going to leave then. Okay. Good night. Thanks. Bye now. <laughs>